Welcome one and all back to the studio. Our power is working as of right now. Stay tuned to find out if that remains the case for the next 90 minutes. But I can say that so far, it's going okay. I'm very excited to be here, especially because joining me on the show, Ravana herself. Ravana, welcome to the Damage Report. Hi, thanks for having me back on. Happy to be here on a Tuesday. Uh, glad to have you here. We kind of had to have you here because we're gonna be doing an initial review, first impressions really of the uh, the Twitch debut of a new political commentator. And uh, you know, I know you're 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 big in Twitch and Twitch culture, so I had to get your perspective on that. So everyone, stay tuned for that. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> I have thoughts. I definitely have thoughts. <laughs> oh, I bet you do. I bet you do. And uh, we we tried to choose a rundown that I think Rayvon is going to have fun with. So we're going to put that to the test. But before we put that to the test, uh, while Rayvana might be the most exciting thing to be revealed uh, joining us on the show today, I do have one other. For months now, I've been receiving a lot of questions about this, and even the beginnings, the stirrings, the fomenting of a rumor that I'd made this up, that it didn't actually happen. Some of you insufficiently loyal, lacking in faith saying, the damage report didn't actually win a Webby because if you won a Webby, where's your Webby? Yeah, well suck on this, it's finally here. It took six months, I don't even remember winning this. Congratulations. Anyway, thank you, I think we won it months and months ago, but they <laughs> take forever. To actually send it to you. So the Webby is now here. And dear God, I don't know where it's going to go because we have a lot of action figures and dragons, but we're going to figure it out. Thank you again for everyone who voted because this is a people's voice um, uh, winner in video series and channels, news and politics. That means that you all voted for it. And so thank you for doing that. Um, exactly, it is a fun looking slinky. I, unlike Brett Ehrlich, will not use it to prop open a door, it will be on display. My one, my only. For the rest of my life award. Anyway, with that said, thank you everyone for joining us. Please hit the like button and share the stream if you haven't already so that people know we're live. And if you want to contact myself or Ray Vano with questions, comments, tweets, concerns, all that, you can do that and we'll respond during our breaks. But with all that said, Ray Vana, are you ready to start the show? I'm so ready. Let's dive right into it, starting with this. Some of those organizations may have said first female prime minister for Italy, but they, they chose the other way um, to describe this. You know, Brett, if you had two hours and could read to the bottom of the New York Times story about her election, you would see that she was historic. But you would have to get through more hard right and far right references. And I guess what I'm wondering is if you're winning elections, if you are what the people want, at what point does that become the center? I mean, who gets to say what is far right? Okay, so there are two important points in there. One, how dare you all in the media not fawn over Giorgia Maloney, founder of the far right Brothers of Italy party, who is, as Trey Gowdy points out there, going to be the first female prime minister in Italy. That is one of the most important distinctions of hers. He's mad that people are focusing on the other one. So just to be clear, Fox in the future would love for you to focus on the identity of a person and not talk at all about their ideology, their positions or anything like that. So let's be very clear about that. Uh, however, he's also wrong there. Some have greeted the fact that she's a woman with a degree of celebration. Hillary Clinton, for instance, said the election of the first woman prime minister in a country always represents a break with the past. And that is certainly a good thing. Which is a questionable thing to say about you know, a politician rising to control a country like Italy when there's a lot of concerns about what she'll do in office. But in particular to pitch it as a break with the past when it is very much the opposite of that thing makes her commentary even more ridiculous. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this though, Ray Vanna. She is the first woman prime minister, uh, you notably are a woman. Or have you, I don't see any balloons in the background. Maybe they've already deflated or something. But are you celebrating for this identity based win for Maloney? Um, I'm not exactly celebrating, uh, maybe despairing a little bit. I will first, I want to acknowledge uh, and give a shout out to Fox News for having such a diverse panel mm -hmm. of constipated looking white men to discuss feminism. Um, good on them for that. <laughs> but it, it just immediately reminds me of that clip from the Eric Andre show where he's asking his guest, so do you think that Margaret Thatcher had girl power? 
It's like <laughs> her being a woman uh, is not nearly as important as her being a literal fascist in ideology, which uh, historically not been great for women. Um, it is just sort of the centering of identity politics. And of course, it's not just the right wing who wants to uh, wants everyone to forget that she's a fascist pushing far right ideology. It's also liberals like Hillary Clinton who think that identity politics is the most important uh, thing and not actually what these politicians stand for. It's really depressing. Of course, I, I'd like to see women in positions of power, but I'd like to see women in positions of power who hold actual good politics and who aren't literally fascist. I mean, she's a Mussolini defender, brazer. She's just a, mm-hmm. she's a fascist. I don't want a female fascist. I don't want a male fascist in any position of power in any country. Yeah, uh, that seems reasonable to me. Um, yeah, and really fast on his second point where he's like, well, who are they to say that she's far right? If that's what the people want, then that's what they want. Well, let's be clear, dude, pump the brakes. Her party got 26% of the vote. So let's just not freak out over like unanimous consent for the far right. And even if people vote for it, that's still that's still what it is. I mean, you can place it on a spectrum, uh, you know, in comparison to other parties, either inside of Italy or around the globe. That's a thing that we can do. But I but I do want to focus on this identity thing because they think that they've got a great point here. So, first of all, is more diversity of a variety of types, including Gender identity important in a lot of ways. Yes, is that the only consideration? No, and no one on the left has literally ever made that claim ever. They characterize us as saying that because they think that that's a straw man. They think they can attack, but it's not. And by the way, you can be excited that she's a woman, even regardless of her politics. You might well be a conservative woman who likes it. You might be a woman who's down with fascism and likes it, but we can also identify that there's a little bit of the like the fun of getting more diversity that's taken away when the person entering the position seems dead set on stripping the rights away from the group that she purports to represent. We can point that out too. Not to say that people won't be inspired by it. Maybe there are little girls who are looking up to Maloney who hope to one day be female accessories to fascism decades in the future. I can't say that that's not true. But we can also critique her on the policy, which is what we're gonna turn to. But Rayvon, any thoughts? Um, yeah, it just, just quickly, it's sort of reminiscent of when Anyas came into power in Bolivia after the coup that ousted Evo Morales. I think New York Times called her something about girl boss. <laughs> girl boss politicians featured her mm-hmm. and she was also a fascist who legalized and oversaw murdering of protesters, predominantly indigenous protesters by the state. So again, it's it's just this, let's forget about policy, let's center identity. And it's really harmful, yeah. it's genuinely harmful. Yeah, exactly. And look, they, they don't, of course they don't mean it. Trey Gowdy doesn't care. It's, I mean, look, if they, if they could have, if they had their druthers, they would have women leaders who support the patriarchy, support white supremacy. And as long as it keeps, you know, corporations and the 1% in a position of economic dominance, They'd be perfectly fine with it, but they don't like it. Let's be clear about that. Let's be clear about one other thing too. So I'm gonna say the thing that as a person who comments on politics, you're not supposed to say. Um, I'm not an expert on Maloney or her party or the the Italian far right. Despite the fact that I am Italian and appreciate a good spicy meatball, I don't know a lot about Italian politics. But let's also be clear that everyone on that panel and everyone in the videos that we're about to show you knows exactly as little as everyone else about these politicians. They don't know what she's going to do. They just have the vague sense that she's probably a fascist and that's what they like. It is at the end of the day, an identity thing, just not a gender identity thing. They don't know about the specifics, but they know that she's largely in line with them ideologically. So what I do is I turn to people who actually do the research. So I'm gonna turn to some great commentary on this by Natasha Lenard of The Intercept, who had some great commentary on the historic role of women in fascism, especially white women. Saying the idea that a woman leader opens doors for other women, as Clinton suggested, is of course laughable. That's especially true when that leader is a fascist keen to stop abortions and do away with employment quotas um, that favor women. Quite literally shutting women in the nuclear home while locking out immigrant women from Italy's body politic altogether. And she contrasts Maloney with some of those 
in American politics in the Republican Party, saying Maloney, like her less polished far right counterparts like Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Greene, weaponizes her role as woman and mother to police the boundaries of womanhood and reproduction. She has framed her poisonous anti immigrant positions as a defense of Italian white women's safety, conjuring well worn tropes of migrants importing sexual violence. And look, that's the thing. Like, can can women hold these positions? Sure. Why are they doing it? Well, look, it, we we often critique how like millimeter deep the the like the facade of right wing populism is. It purports to be against the establishment. It is anything but. She is going to give unto business what it wants and give unto the wealthy what they want. The populism part of it has nothing in common with populism when it's applied to left wing politics. All it means is. It's more virulently anti-immigrant than regular conservatism, which is hardly welcoming when it comes to migrants. It's even more aggressively anti-LGBTQ in comparison to regular conservatives who've never accepted the LGBTQ community. That's all it is. It's conservatism, but crueler. That's that's basically what it is. Um, we'll get to more of her positions, but Ravon, I want to give you a chance to weigh in. Um, yeah, so sort of going back to this idea of uh, women breaking, like women in politics breaking down uh, barriers and shattering the glass ceiling for women uh, to look up to, for, for women who want to pursue positions in politics later. Like, if they have good politics, sure, that, that is true. But um, so when it comes to Margaret Thatcher, when she died, there was a BBC interview where they talked to these Scottish women who were celebrating her death, and it's a hilarious interview. If you just Google uh, Margaret Thatcher, old Scottish woman, it'll come up. It's fantastic. But um, one of the uh, interviewers asked the, one of the women uh, if she's didn't Margaret Thatcher show that a woman could become prime minister? Isn't that important? And the woman says, why would you want a woman like that to be prime minister? Someone who's a warmonger in that position? And she was exactly right. And that's like reminiscent to me of what's going on right now. It's not shattering a glass ceiling. It's not, it's not, she's, these people are not people you should look up to. This is not someone that little girls should think, oh, maybe one day I can be in that position because she was. You want someone who's going to have good politics and actually represent the rights of women uh, and, and do it well in these positions as someone people can look up to, not people who are going to actively harm the rights of women. So um, we, we have some other videos we have to get to. So why don't we turn now to uh, why some on the right are so excited by her. And in particular, it's it's the populism thing that's about trans people, not the populism thing that's about corporations getting away with economic murder. Uh, as you'll see in this clip from Tucker Carlson. If you want to establish totalitarian control over a country, of course you have to destroy the family first. Because nobody with deep family loyalty, the one thing every person should have, no one who has that will ever pledge absolute obedience to a politician. Why would you? So if you want absolute obedience, you have to sever family ties. And that's why state schools brainwash your children with values that you despise and then instruct your children to turn you in as a thought criminal if you object. That's happening. It's not your imagination and it's happening for a reason. Wokeness is not just a political ideology. It's not just something annoying that emerged on college campuses that we can ignore. It's a state religion that supplants actual religion, which is also being destroyed. There's a reason the strip bars and the liquor stores and the weed dispensaries stayed open under COVID, but the churches didn't. Okay, so credit to Tucker Carlson. Uh, he didn't slam on the desk during that. He didn't talk about them turning the frogs gay, but that was just Alex Jones. That's all that. That's equally as deranged as anything anyone says on Infowars. The idea that I, I don't even know since he he so rarely speaks with any specificity. It's all vague illusion. I don't even know who he's claiming wants to destroy the family so that you will pledge absolute loyalty to a politician. But I got news for him as a member of the left. I don't give a damn about him and his family. I don't care what they get up to as long as they leave other people alone. And I feel like the vast majority of leftists agree with that. We're interested in you not pushing your religious values on other people. Outside of that, you can do whatever you want. You want to go bass fishing or I don't care. You want to do a purity ball? I don't care. I'm not interested in that stuff. Um, and the idea that you do that so that we would pledge loyalty. 
Tucker Carlson is an enthusiastic continuing supporter of a political movement, the MAGA movement, wherein anyone, even a multi decade serving Republican politician, who in any way questions even one of the conspiracy theories that Donald Trump baselessly throws out, will be summarily thrown out of the party. If you don't have his, like, if he doesn't shine his orange light on you, you have no chance of winning a primary. How dare you criticize him? And you're talking about how we pledge absolute loyalty to politicians. I like Bernie. I think AOC is pretty cool. I'm not pledging absolute loyalty to them. But you take a look at these MAGA people and their relationship with Trump. He is describing that and I think he knows it. There's other stuff in there that I definitely want to get to. But this is how excited they get when they have fascism apparently on the rise in another country, Ravana. Yeah, I also have not um, given my absolute loyalty and fealty to Bernie Sanders, but I do have the super fun Bernie Sanders yeah. <laughs> chairman of the budgetary committee shirt on right now that you can get from shop TYT. Um, You've pledged loyalty. <laughs> um, but I, a couple things I wanted to point out. One, he says state schools in that a couple times. He's talking about public schools and he calls mm-hmm. them state schools because that sounds a lot scarier than public schools, but he's literally talking about the free education that the government is supposed to provide to your children so that we can have a well educated population. But make it scary. State school. Um, another thing is the idea that uh, that that um, totalitarian governments destroy the concept of the nuclear family so that the population will establish loyalty and fealty to them is one of the most ridiculous things that he could have said <laughs> when he's talking about Italy because Benito Mussolini kind of did the exact opposite of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Literally encouraged families to have as many children as possible and still mm-hmm. managed to establish a totalitarian regime in that country. So I mean he's you know, he's preying upon the ignorance of his audience yep. and just just trying to create fear in them. And of course, they are ignorant and probably don't know <laughs> the policies of Benito Mussolini or other totalitarian governments, and why what he said is so absurd. And it's just so infuriating to watch. 100, 100%. I mean, and, and look, I should have fleshed this out earlier when I was talking about the comparison to Alex Jones. The idea that they've turned kids into snitches on their parents if they're insufficiently woke. Come on. Does, seriously, <laughs> does anyone watching this actually think that? He knows that you will immediately react on some deep base level with. Really? Because then he says, you're not just imagining it, it's happening. You don't need to say that about something that's self evident. One other thing too, I understand that this is one of the the smallest points there. But I love the condescending rhetorical questions he throws at his audience, knowing that they're not gonna actually think about it. They'll just continue watching his show and be bombarded with more nonsense. There's a reason that the pot shops and the liquor stores were kept open, but the churches were closed. Yeah. There, there are a couple of good reasons why that might have happened. Um, uh, let's see, the, the former are businesses and we're worried about them all going out of business. Uh, oh, Also, they don't require large congregations of people, quite literally. A couple of people can go in and then leave, it's far safer. Oh, Also, you can get the services from a church remotely via a webcam. Hard to do that with liquor, I've tried and I've totally ruined that webcam. Um, I had to order another one from Logitech. So there's a lot of good reasons, no, but seriously, like think about how self-evidently ridiculous that comparison is. And yet he throws it out there knowing not a single member of his audience is gonna think, wait, that's that's BS. I'm gonna change the channel. It's just not going to happen. I like anyway. that he said weed bars. Also, I don't really I don't know. I don't know what a weed bar is. It sounds cool. That is. I, also, the strip clubs did not stay open during COVID. That's just I I mean, maybe the ones near him did and he was frequenting them or something, but uh, I don't know. I, I know the not. ones here did not. <laughs> I'm not familiar with it. Also, it's just, it's such a condescending approach to the news. Right before that clip, he said, they've labeled her far right because she dares to say the family is under attack. No, that's not, no, that's not why she was labeled far. She was labeled far right because the anti immigrant stuff, the anti abortion stuff, like a long list of actual policies that you don't want to acknowledge. You'll notice that in his defense of her, he's not citing all of those things. He doesn't want to get into specifics about what she thinks what she says and what she'll actually do. It's just very, let's keep it vague, please. Vague stuff about the family being under attack or something like that. 
Okay, with that said, uh, man, God, obviously we could go like a full hour on this. Let's jump to this next video. I'm so excited. You know, it's funny, I looked I looked this uh, Italian uh, Ms. Maloney up uh, when I heard about her about a week ago and I couldn't find any just straight up information on her. Everything was, she's a fascist, <laughs> she's a, a racist, she's this, she's that. And I thought, wow, this is somebody who I can relate to because they're doing the same thing about me. And it, it makes me yes. realize that if they're not calling you all of these slurs, if they're not attacking you, then you're probably not truly representing the people of your country. It's all, she's a fascist, she's a racist. And I thought, she's like me. That is. <laughs> A hell of a sound bite, Carrie Lake. Um, but by the way, you need to understand the context, okay? This is crucial. Before that clip, the way that Tucker introduced her was, she was one of the people who noticed this movement in Italy and was sounding the alarm about it before anyone else. So thank you for doing that. And then he introduced her and she drops this bomb. I first read about her a week ago and I couldn't find any information. He's like pretending she's Nostradamus who 60 years ago predicted the rise of the far right in Italy. She Googled her a week ago and apparently couldn't find any information. I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. You can find any number of different things that she said, her entire political history, her quotes about Mussolini, all of that is available. Neither of them has any curiosity whatsoever. They understand what she, the, the purpose that she serves as a symbol, how the far right in the US can use her. Beyond that, they don't care. Any of her actual quotes or actual positions, those might be inconvenient. Those might scare people away because it so directly invokes the dark history of World War II. I'm sorry, it was just so crazy that she admitted that she just Googled her for the first time. Also, I love that she referred to fascism and being called racist as slurs. Because I mean, it's genuinely true. The worst thing you can call a, a white conservative is a racist. They think it's as bad, if not worse, than being called the N-word. So to them, mm -hmm. that that probably resonates really strongly. Calling yeah. someone racist is a slur. <laughs> yeah, and she also said something to the effect of there, if they're not calling you a racist or a fascist, then you're not representing the people. And I feel like I feel like you could do it without meriting those attacks. I feel like yeah. a couple of people have probably done it historically without being called fascists. So ridiculous. And 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 by the way, like Tucker, he brings her on to make the case to the American people that Carrie Lake is similar to Maloney. So when they tell you who they are, believe them. He earlier said about Maloney, listen to this thing about her talking really vaguely about the family and think, would I support a candidate like that here? And the thing is, I, I don't doubt it. Like all this is, is the continued normalization of you know, like the growth of authoritarian fascism around the globe. That's all it is. I mean, this, this isn't the first country they're doing it with. He loves Bolsonaro. He literally just released a basically fact-free documentary about Bolsonaro like a week ago. He obviously loves uh, Orban. Like, like you, they're telling us who they are. I don't know how much clearer they can possibly make it about where they see their place politically what ideological tradition it's in, who they see as their natural allies. But don't you dare call them semi-fascist, Dark Brandon, okay? That would be crossing the line. Anyway, let's go to one more clip. Difficult problems. Yet they did the same thing to Trump, did they not? I mean, they called him an autocrat and he was a mini dictator and he was gonna start World War III. The same playbook against Trump they're using against these new populist leaders in Europe. Yes, I mean, it's the only playbook they have, which is to demonize their opponents as fascists and bigots and racists. And both the American people and our friends across Europe aren't buying the lies and smears anymore. Look, as you said, who's really fascist here? It was Biden's DOJ that sent a SWAT team that sent 30 armed federal agents to a pro-life pastor's house. While real criminals, violent thugs, gang members are on the streets shooting people, beating them, assaulting them, undisturbed, unmolested, no one's even touching them. This administration is the administration that is trampling on our basic rights and freedoms, whether you're talking about Maloney or Donald Trump or every single House member running under the Republican banner this year. They're gonna label all of them as fascist. And you know what? The more they lie, the more the American people are gonna rise up and say no. You gotta love him claiming like nobody's buying it in Italy and America. They're not buying, again, 
party got 26% of the vote. It's bad and because you know they have this uh, complex parliamentary system where there's proportional representation mixed with some first past the post. That means that she in, in, in combination with other far right parties will be in control, but it's 26%. Oh, Also, Trump lost the election. I know that they love to pretend that that didn't happen, but let's be clear about that. So if you're talking about if people are in support of something that makes it good, it kind of by definition makes your movement bad. But more importantly, like think about the projection there. That Biden is trampling on people's rights. They literally just banned abortion in multiple states over the past month. What rights has Biden taken away? I honestly don't know because as always, they're not making any specific claims. He doesn't cite which uh, which rights of yours have been taken away. I know that they're coming to take your guns away to probably tomorrow. It's been true for the last 20 years. Someday they're gonna get around to it. But you'll notice also there, he said, as an example of Biden apparently being a totalitarian, they sent F or DOJ agents to this pro-life pastor's house. You'll notice he doesn't say why. You wanna know why? Because that guy had multiple times gone to abortion clinics and assaulted people physically. And finally, they were doing something about it. They, they have been defending him on Fox all week about that, never citing the violence that actually led to it. So he wants to pretend that he's against violence and he'll invoke as fascists always do, the idea of mostly the idea is you're supposed to be scared of ethnic minority thugs and gang members go running rampant in the city centers. That's a common trope. Um, but he's perfectly fine with that pro life pastor assaulting multiple people as he tries to strip people's rights away. Ravon, I know like we, we shouldn't expect much from Stephen Miller. He's a propagandist. If, if, if this was, you know, late 30s in Germany, he would be rushing to throw on the uniform. Nobody's surprised by that. But the, the fact that there's no pushback, there's no, he doesn't have to say anything specific. It's just so frustrating. I mean, not even just 1930s Germany, he would be rushing. He's wearing it under that suit right then in that interview. He's always <laughs> got a Nazi uniform underneath his clothes, like, like, a, like a Nazi Superman just waiting to rip it <laughs> off. But uh, I, do, I do like the, the idea that these politicians, these you know, populist, fascist, far right politicians, particularly in Europe, as he mentioned, are being branded by the left, by the woke, uh, as racist, as fascist, as whatever, whatever. But they're not, they're being branded by that as themselves. You know, they're doing it themselves, they're, especially in Europe. You know, a lot of politicians who are racist, far right conservatives in America have to put up this sort of veneer of, oh, I'm not racist, I just don't like immigration. Whereas a lot of far right fascist politicians in Europe don't do that, they'll say, Oh yes, I am racist. I don't mm-hmm. want these types of, you know, immigrants coming to our country because I want to preserve the the white race in our country. So so it's just a ridiculous idea that they're being branded this way because oh the left just hates family values and not because that is literally how they are representing themselves to the yeah. world. Yeah, the right wing here has got to be so jealous of that. The fact that you can just be relatively more open about it. Little update on other stuff going on on the network today. Obviously, Indisputable will be coming up right after our program. But also, I'm gonna be leading the first hour of the Young Turks with Cenk Uger later on today. I believe Jessica Burbank is going to be leading the second hour. Anna is off on a well-deserved vacation. So we're gonna be having a little fun in the meantime. I think myself and Jessica are doing the Wednesday first hour as well. But anyway, definitely stay tuned. We've got more news, hit the like button if you haven't already, if you're joining us late. And let's jump into this. Excellent. <laughs> the violence. Well, the voting. Let's get right let's get to right the to violence. Let's get right to it. Man. Shoot to kill. See, a, see an Antifa? Shoot to kill. Come. Yeah. Done with this bullshit. That is video that has now been released from a documentary crew embedded with Roger Stone for some time. It happened before the 2020 election. And there, I understand much of it had to be bleeped out. A little bit more of it should have been than was. But anyway, it's him saying, forget the voting. I'm not interested in it. Let's just skip to the violence. If you see Antifa, shoot to kill. That's what he said. He's gonna run from it. His attempt to distract you from what he said is hilarious. And we'll get to that. But this video was released by Christopher Goldbranson and Frederick Marbell. There's other video that they got as well. We're gonna talk about some of it here. Others will be released tomorrow when the January 6th hearings resume. Bear in mind, the Washington Post says that later in that same video, 
Stone followed up his call for violence saying, only kidding, we renounce violence completely. We totally renounce violence. The left is the only ones who engage in violence. This is of course like like six weeks, maybe eight weeks before January 6th, so that's fun. Anyway, the filmmakers told Don Lemon they found Stone's backtracking insincere and said it was done, quote, with more of a wink and a nod. That's sort of what I would have expected. In any event, um, he had been spending the months leading up to that point largely saying the same thing. This voting isn't necessary. We shouldn't abide by the results of the election. He said in July of 2020, the election will not be normal. Sorry, we're not accepting them, he said of the anticipated results. We're challenging them in court. If the electors show up at the Electoral College, armed guards will throw them out. I'm challenging all of it. And the judges we're going to are judges I appointed. There he's speaking as Trump. So definitely a guy who on the one hand loves democracy and on the other hand had a lot of faith that Trump was gonna legitimately win this thing, Ravana. <laughs> I I love the uh, oh, it was just a joke. I was just kidding. It, it reminds me of you know a lot of Twitch streamers and YouTubers who say something in a live stream that might violate TOS. Mm -hmm. uh, follow it up by saying, oh, in Minecraft, in a video game, in Roblox. Like mm -hmm. I didn't mean it in real life. So it's sort of Roger Stone was just like, oh, shoot Antifa on site uh, in a video game. I was joking. It wasn't mm -hmm. wasn't real life, but I mean, it really shouldn't surprise anybody. Roger Stone has been trying to undermine democracy for decades. He was involved in the Brooks Brothers riots, which helped um, George Bush win the 2000 election, uh, which he otherwise would not have. So yeah, I mean, it's his his job is essentially to undermine yeah. democracy. Hundred percent. Yeah, and to be very clear, most of them will never imply or didn't imply at this point that Trump could ever legitimately lose or that the polling, which had been consistent for literally months that he was behind, could be true. Uh, Roger Stone does in the videos. I'm just gonna read this quote for you. He said, so let's say that Trump is a little behind right now, which he probably is, that doesn't bother me. But even if he wins an honest election, we're not gonna have an honest election. They're stealing this blind in Florida right now. No, like this is like, again, it's Roger Stone, nobody's surprised by this. He was never going to accept the results. They'd probably prefer if Trump legitimately won, but if he didn't, they don't care. They're not interested in democracy, they're interested in power. They can't make that any clearer to you. Um, by the way, we're gonna get to his response in a sec, but there's another clip of him and his crew on January 6th after like, you know, things don't work out the way they wanted and democracy didn't end that day. Stay tuned. Um, they're like getting ready to flee. So there's this clip of him on the phone in the DC Willard Hotel in what he dubbed the war room. Who he's talking to isn't yet clear, they say, but he can be heard telling them, all right, well, we're gonna start pulling our stuff together. He then turns to Kristen Davis, a close associate, and says, let's pack. We're out of here as soon as possible. They wanna get out of town. You definitely, definitely are innocent. You didn't do anything wrong or intend to do anything wrong. If the second the plot falls apart, you flee the city limits. That's what I would say, Grafana. Oh yeah, I mean, pretty much every time I do something that's totally legal, my first thought is, oh, I got to get the hell out of town. Like, mm -hmm. you know, every, every every time I every time I'm following the law to a T, I'm like, well, it's time to go. But I mean, it's one of the things that I think is just so offensive is how flagrantly he is violating the law and doing so pretty publicly, and he's just like sort of smiling and laughing about it because he's fairly confident that he will. Suffer no serious repercussions because yeah. you know he's been he's been meddling in elections for for years. He's hoping that even if something were to like be more serious down the road, as far as repercussions for him come, he's like, well, I've got you know I've got something in the works for the next presidential election. Let me get another or let me get a part and let me get my sentence commuted if that happens. Like I'm gonna be okay, but <laughs> but just like the. Doing this so in the open because he's so confident is like, it hurts to watch. Yeah, and let me close by just reading his response because we're obligated. You know, we're we're serious ethical journalists. Uh, he says, "I challenge the accuracy and the authenticity of these videos and believe they've been manipulated and selectively edited." I also point out that the filmmakers do not have the legal right to use them. Well, wait, they're not real. What are you talking about? If they're made <laughs> up, if I invented them, I can use them if I want to. Pick a defense buddy. How ironic that Kim Kardashian and I are both subjected to computer manipulated videos on the same day. Okay, Stone, stay on message. I understand Pete Davidson moved on, but this is not the time to shoot your shot, okay, buddy? Anyway, 
He goes on to say, the excerpts you provided below prove nothing. Certainly, they do not prove I had anything to do with the events of January 6th. Well, how could they? You said they're made up. You seem to be implying they're authentic and yet don't prove anything wrong. He said they're deep fake videos. You chose to have the documentarians with you for three years and they suffered, by the way. I'm sure having to spend time with you for multiple years. You can't now claim afterward that the videos are all deep fakes. But by the way, get used to this. From now on, when a politician or someone involved in politics says something bad on tape, they're automatically going to claim that it's a deep fake. And sometimes they might be right. Some videos are manipulated, but they're gonna claim it in every single case. Let's just be clear about that. I just think it's wild that he's claiming both that it is manipulated, that it's a deep fake, and that somehow it's illegal for them to use it. And first, and somehow, even if it's not a deep fake, it doesn't prove what they're trying to say it proves. But it's definitely a deep fake, but it's also illegal footage obtained illegally by the camera yep. crew that I gave permission to follow me around for three years. But but it's fake and it's illegal, so you Wait, can't use it. Ravana, what if it is a deep fake? It was manipulated, but he made it and copyrighted wrote it, and now they've stolen it. It all comes <laughs> together. It's all perfect. Anyway. We'll see what happens with him. I honestly like I I don't think he's gonna testify or whatever with the hearings. I honestly don't want him to because he'll just say a bunch of crazy stuff. Like there's no limits on Roger Stone. We we had our little showdown, you know, with Alex Jones at the RNC. And I remember Roger Stone. Roger Stone is exactly the sort of toady that he stood like a couple feet to the side and back from Alex Jones. And like when things got tense, he like receded into this crowd of Infowars people like Homer into a bush. It was <laughs> hilarious. He wants to like pretend that he's a tough guy, like shoot to kill. <laughs> don't come near me. <laughs> Nobody was doing anything. There wasn't any violence. I don't know why he was fleeing for his life, but he was. Yesterday, we revealed the initial details about what seemed like it could have been a bombshell from Denver Riggleman, a former Republican representative who had served on the January 6 hearing committee, like advising them until April. And he dropped this bombshell about this nine second phone call that was apparently made on January 6 that started in the White House and went to one of the insurrectionists. And at the time, the only information that was available about that call was regrettably coming from the New York Daily News. But it turns out that they were actually right about the detail. The cell phone that was called did belong to a 26 year old Trump supporter from Brooklyn named Anton Lunick, who had traveled to DC the night before January 6 with two friends, Francis Connor and Antonio Frigno. You can see the trio actually here. They were charged with entering and remaining in the Capitol unlawfully, violently entering the Capitol, disorderly conduct, whole bunch of stuff. Anyway. Last April, they pleaded guilty to one count of parading, demonstrating, or picketing inside the Capitol. And earlier this month, they were sentenced to a few months of home confinement, probation, and small fines. Now, we have learned more about them that maybe could inform our view of this call. There are no known ties between those three men and any of the organized groups that attacked the Capitol. So, although they were there, there's no evidence that they're part of the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys. Although they do like to joke about those groups in their online messages, including in November 2020, with Frigno renaming one of their Instagram group chats, the Proud Boys, before renaming it the Proud Boy and Friends and the Oath Keepers in January. So I guess they just looked up to it. They didn't wanna make a commitment or whatever. But also importantly, based on the timeline of the phone call, it appears that the call, when it was made, they probably weren't even in DC. They were probably driving back to New York at that point. So there's another important detail about this group, but as of right now, it doesn't really seem like there's much here. And as we'll get to, members of the actual January 6th committee, they don't seem to think that there's anything here. And they're throwing cold water on what Riggleman is, is apparently maybe trying to use to sell books. Rivana, what do you think? I like the idea that they are <laughs> renaming their group chat like they are pledging a frat. Like they're just they're <laughs> they're not ready to commit. To a which white nationalist insurrectionist group they're going to join. So one day it's the Proud Boys, next day it's the Oath Keepers. Maybe they'll separate and make their own like neo Nazi <laughs> group. <laughs> I'm really excited to see the developments in that. Well, I've got a development for you, and it's that although 
they've already gone through the the, the actual legal process for January 6th and they, then they received some consequences which well, I mean we don't we don't know that they were like one of the ones who were trying to beat cops to death with Trump flags and stuff like that. So maybe the, the sentence they got is perfectly legit and uh, they don't seem to be working with any of the militias so that's good. However, they did send messages between each other that included sexually violent and threatening rhetoric about former Vice President Mike Pence, Nancy Pelosi, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Andrew Cuomo. Here are some examples. Our end goal was to brutally murder Pence and Pelosi, and sadly today they're still breathing. Therefore, we must come back stronger and fiercely next time around. That was from Connor to Ferrigno and Lunick and the others, two days after the insurrection. Uh, Lunick said, if they take my money, I'm going to shoot Pelosi. Connor texted to the others, we raped AOC. So I think that it's important that we step in at this moment and chastise AOC for implying that the right has some sort of weird sexual obsession with her. Why does she keep saying that, Ravana? Why does she keep implying that they're obsessed with her? Why is she so obsessed with them? There's something wrong with AOC. That's what I'm learning from these three guys that broke into the Capitol and fantasize about murdering politicians and also raping them. It has been so infuriating to see. I mean, not just right wingers, but honestly, some people on the left saying that, oh, AOC was overreacting, saying she was fearful for her life. I've seen the replies to just any tweet that she has. She has yeah. cause to be fearful of her life generally, probably all the time, based on just the threats that people are posting on social media. But in this instance, these were people who like were joking about, but actually sincerely talking about sexually assaulting her, murdering her. It was, I'm tired of like the downplaying of the fears that these politicians might have had in that day. They were yeah. real, they were legitimate. These are disgusting comments. And the right does have a sick, sick, sexualizing and, and violent nature towards AOC. And every time she calls it out, people not just on the right, but on the left dismiss it when they're doing it in front of our very eyes. That that yep. god awful comedian uh, who went to the Capitol and was like talking about her butt and her body and how like he wanted to have sex with her and like gross violent terms. That happened and she said the same thing and people were, were dismissing that. I mean, they're doing it in front of our eyes. She's showing the world the evidence and they're still so dismissive of it. It's really 100%, 100%. So uh, th this might be the last that we hear about this particular call. It might, you know, as we you know, speculated yesterday, it might mean literally nothing. It was only nine seconds. We have no idea of who sent it. It might mean literally nothing. And these guys don't seem to have been one of those who actually were trying to kill people. But I will leave you with this. If they had come across AOC, these three individuals who love to openly fantasize about raping and feel comfortable, by the way, talking to each other about it. Do you think that I group text my male friends about who I want to rape? That is not a normal thing for men, or at least not for any man that I have been friends with. So when she talked about her fears, they mocked her for months. And you had guys like this. And they, were, they weren't even the worst, they weren't associated with the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers. How many of the men in that group do you think if they had been in the room with her that she wouldn't have had every, every reason to be afraid? Okay, everybody, let's finish the first hour with some fun. We warned you a week ago that Matt Gates was going to be diving into Twitch, and he did. He actually had his first stream ever, and it was whatever the hit version of a thing is that only six people maximum watch at any particular time. Now, that is seriously, supposedly, his max viewership, six. This many, like they could be in the background of this one shot right now, all of the people who watched it simultaneously. So he was very excited, he had someone make a graphic, um, that's fun. And the weird thing is, like when I saw this headline, I didn't even believe it, man. I know I don't like him, I wanna believe bad things, but I'm, I'm biased. But um, he has 1.7 million followers on Twitter. And he now does have 1.9 thousand followers on Twitch, but they apparently weren't watching. 
And so I tried to dive into this and I looked for the actual numbers. Like this couldn't be true. So I went to Twitch Tracker to try to find information about the performance of his stream. And unfortunately, it, it doesn't even, there's no videos, there's no clips. They don't have any information about him, which probably isn't a good sign. Um, what I do like there, if we could put that up for a second, is that it does identify on the left hand side that he is both an affiliate and also the stream is 18 plus, which is a very much a new policy for Matt Gates. So I'm glad that he's moving into that territory. But anyway, uh, he left his chat running while he was offline. And uh, the chatters did continue to talk, slamming him, leaving vulgar ASCII images in the chat, many depicting male genitals, calling him a pedo and things like that. So he is building a community, Ravana, if nothing else. I love this so much. First of all, shout out to all the offline chatters who are putting in the work trying to get Matt Gates banned. <laughs> That's why they do that, which is why a lot of a lot of streamers sometimes will, if they're getting harassed, turn off offline chat so that they can't like, because people will put inappropriate messages in the chat and then report the chat to totally. get the streamer banned. So fingers crossed that it, it works out for them. Uh, I would like to uh, brag that I have more followers on Twitch than Matt Gates. <laughs> I also have uh, hundreds of more average viewers. So uh, get owned, uh, you know. Matt Gates. Get owned, but it's it's really funny because I mean, what he's trying to do, right? He's a younger Republican politician. The idea is that he's you know uh, appealing to a young audience who uses Twitch. That's not who they're. Even if they are younger politicians, Marjorie Taylor Greene, relatively younger, uh, Lauren Boebert, um, the Madison Cawthorn, who's no longer a politician, uh, and God knows what he will be doing once you know, <laughs> but <laughs> since he's out of office, but. So when it comes to all of uh, of them, they're appealing to old people. I'm sorry, their audience is not just because they're younger. Their audience is not like a younger generation of Republicans who are sure. using Twitch. It's still older people who probably can't figure out how to add Twitch to their phones and will not be watching those streams. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not saying that no young people like Matt Gates. I mean, he's got this constituency of college Republicans who are technically 19 but look 40. He's got <laughs> those, I guess. Um, but anyway, no, I don't think it's gonna be. And, and by the way, you gotta love a guy following up, apparently seemingly narrowly dodging a like underage human trafficking scandal and then immediately diving into Twitch. <laughs> don't start dancing on TikTok, Matt Gates. You're just, you're putting too much of the spotlight on yourself. <laughs> but anyway, and, and by the way, projecting forward, flashing forward, I have no doubt that eventually he's gonna have some viewers at some point. He does have a lot of uh, Twitter followers. And by the way, this is not a difficult product to sell. Just having someone yelling at you if you're a uh, like a really fragile white male that you are simultaneously the best person in the world and also the biggest victim on the planet, that is always going to appeal to some people. Having a guy like Matt Gates, you know, criticizing, I don't know, She-Hulk or something, there are gonna be some really pathetic, weak, fragile, broken men that are gonna tune into that. But it does not look good to start off with six viewers, though. Like you were just teeing yourself up for well deserved mockery. Yeah, I mean, deeply embarrassing. Deeply embarrassing. And by the way, I just want to give a little bit of credit to um, to Hassan, who uh, so he tweeted out this thing of like linking the child predators uh, on Twitch to Matt Gates, which is funny. And then he like tweeted out, this is certainly what we need on the platform about Matt Gates, to which Matt Gates replied, I agree. Thanks for tuning in, Hassan. Don't forget to subscribe, which might be sarcastic or not, I, I don't know and I don't particularly care. But it did provide the opportunity for Hassan to change his display name to Gates Pedo FBI Investigation, <laughs> which then appeared underneath Matt Gates's quote retweet. So well done, Hassan. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna bring if you're gonna start a twi uh, like a Twitch war with Hassan, you got to bring more than six allies, Matt Gates. Yeah, um, and just like you were saying, he has a million some followers on Twitter. Uh, one thing I've noticed streaming on Twitch, however many followers you have on other platforms is not necessarily a strong indicator of how oh. well you will do on Twitch. Is there's not like a lot of cross platform viewership in that case. So, you know, maybe yeah. he'll never have more than six viewers and we can laugh at him until his, you know, Twitch endeavor eventually fizzles out. Fingers crossed. I could use that. Anyway, that's all the time we have for our first hour. Lots more to come in the aftermath, including Dr. Oz making the most embarrassing political own goal I think I've literally ever seen in my life. That's coming up after this.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.